Has anyone ever forgotten here anything? I guess not. Some of you have. Okay. What if, uh, um, I forgot what I was going to say. <clears throat> and you guys are just like snoring today. That was funny. <laughs> we are, we're trying to get all of our stuff together ready for spring. And one of the things I like to do is to, I, I like flowers. And so I'm trying to figure out and remember where all that stuff is. And it's difficult to remember where the stuff is because you put it away last fall. Or in our case, sometimes you put some of those things away and you don't remember where they went to when you moved in. Has anyone ever have that problem where you put something away and then you need it and then you can't find it anymore? Yeah, exactly. I get that kind of stuff going on for me. Um, it's rare, very rare, but... Um, Sometimes it happens. And I was wondering about why, when you read the Bible, that God often tells us the same story over and over again. Some of you, some of you are reading through the New Testament. Anyone here reading through the New Testament? Uh, we have about a week and a half left. And if you're reading through the New Testament, some folks said, I was really amazed to find out that, um, that it's the same story over and over and over again. Like when they were reading the Gospels, it was like, oh, okay, we got through Matthew. This sounds very familiar when I'm reading Mark. This sounds very familiar when reading Luke. This sounds familiar when I'm reading John. It's the same story that they just told over. Uh, isn't that just in there? And some of them even have references where you can flip back and forth. Why on earth would all four Gospels need to be in the Bible? Can I tell you why? It's because we forget we forget. We need to be reminded. Now, we may not, we may know once, we, once we're reminded, but we need to be reminded. Well, the author of Hebrews, uh, we don't know who the author of Hebrews is. Some people do believe that um, it's another one of Paul's letters, but most of them don't because it's written a lot differently than the other, the other of Paul's letters, so most of them don't. Some of them believe that it was probably a student of Paul's uh, probably uh, Barnabas or maybe Apollos, but um, really it doesn't say. So we don't know who wrote. But we do know that they're writing to folks and trying to rem remind them over and over. If you look in Hebrews, you'll find that's where the, what I call the Faith Hall of Fame is at. So if you haven't gotten to the Faith Hall of Fame, they're going to recount all the people, mostly from the, from the Old Testament, but some from the New, about how these people were faithful. And so we call, they, they are named in this Hall of Fame. But at the same time, the author of this letter is telling us in this passage that we should go on to become more mature. Now, some of us are doing a pretty good job of that, right? Look, this is a sign of maturity. <laughs> we should become more mature. Not only that, let's take a look at it again. So we're going back to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, and we're going to say, well, this is what he says. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. So he's saying that we should already know some of this stuff. The first thing that, he, that is raised up is, let's not lay again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. Repentance. When this is... This is a question that's in, um, it's part of the, the Apostles' Creed. It's also part, no, I take that back. It's part of the, the vows that, we, um, that are said at our baptism. And, it's, and when we have confirmation, then confirmation is just a confirmation of baptism. So in my years of being a pastor, what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk to each kid alone. And we've talked about what these things mean over and over again in class. And, but each time I slide the book over and say, okay, I just want to make sure you know what you're saying when you're being confirmed. And one of the first questions, do you repent of your sins? And I'll say, do you, can you say yes to that? Yeah. Can you tell me what repentance means? And this is what they say. Oh, mm. I'm sorry. 
So this is what I invite them to do. If you're able, stand up. Now, repentance literally means to go in the opposite direction. So when I tell you to repent, I want you to make a 180. Repent. Repent. Repent! Yeah, you didn't do that. Come on, sit down. See, that's no wonder we need to be reminded about this over and over again. (laughs) Repent. Repent literally means to turn the opposite direction. That's the Hebrew. So if if we were learning in Hebrew, it means you're walking in this way. If someone says for you to repent, it's to turn around and to walk in the opposite direction. So we are called to repentance because there are times, friends, when we are not following what God wants us to do. And that is when God says, repent. And when we repent, it's not just saying, I'm sorry. In fact, really, that's not part of the language at all. It says, stop doing the wrong and start doing the right. That is repentance. Now, if you want to say, I'm sorry for the sins, that's called contrition. But I can tell you about contrition. Some of you are parents. Some of you have been a, a kid before. And some of you don't, um, hadn't ever been experienced your childhood, but probably still know what I'm talking about. So, I want you to imagine um, some young person acting in a way that's not appropriate. Whatever, and you can imagine whatever you want to. And then they know that they're acting in an, inappropri- in an inappropriate way. And so in comes the authority figure. And they look at the authority figure and go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now that is not contrition. That is fear. <laughs> that is fear. Contrition would really mean that they had time to reflect on what they had done and knew that it was wrong. That's contrition. But what God calls us to do isn't contrition. Uh, that's, you'll read about that in the scripture. But what's paramount for God is for us to stop doing what's wrong and doing what's right. That's repentance. That's an elementary teaching of Christianity. Well, then the author goes on to say from repentance, I want you to know about, um, where do we go? All right, go to faith in God. Faith in God. Now, faith is basically believing something that you don't necessarily see, but you know it's going to happen. For instance, I have faith that when I call the kids to come up here, that one of them is going to be a challenge. I have faith that that's going to happen. I have faith that one of them will be able to say something. I have faith that somebody will ask a question. Because without that, um, our children's sermon would be kind of me just preaching at them. I have faith that sometimes you will laugh at my jokes. More often. (laughs) It will happen in time. Once I get the electricity all keyed up to all those pews, it will happen a lot more often. (laughs) Faith. Now, we can have faith in all kinds of things, but this is the elementary piece here is faith in God. That means that even though we don't necessarily know how it's going to all work out, we have faith that it will work out. Because God is in control. That's faith in God. Now, there are some times, friends, when my faith wavers, and there are some times when I lose sight of the the cross because I get distracted. I think that other things are happening on that are going to be greater and bigger. Um, Recently, we've heard all kinds of things about this plane that's missing, right? And I heard all kinds of things, well, maybe that plane's been hijacked, and what they're going to do is use that as a bomb to bomb us sometime. I mean, they'll use it as some way to bring in new... And, and I'm thinking, well, that, oh, oh, we should have a law. Yeah, that will stop them. We should have a law. And I think, nah, I'm ready to go home. Bring it on. I have faith that God is always at work, 
even when it seems like everything is falling around me. The rock will never fail. All right, so then there's this instruction about baptism. Instruction about baptism, some folks meant that to be, uh, oh, how people might be baptized. Uh, uh, Ray McKenzie told me a little joke on the way out about um, someone, who is, someone who believes in full immersion and some believes who is just sprinkling. And uh, eventually, basically, the, 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 the end of the joke was, um, is it, if, I didn't, if I only got baptized up to this much water, would that still be enough? And the other person said, no, that's not enough. You have to be fully, goes, oh, so what you're saying is just the very little bit on top is effective. Uh, it was funnier when he said it. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, so baptism. Ba baptism basically means that our heart has been changed to understand that Jesus is our Savior. That through Jesus we die to our death, and through Jesus we rise again. And if you have that understanding, um, I don't care how the water was applied to you. That's baptism. And then it goes on, let's see, we got baptism, we got laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. So, all those things are elementary teachings. And they were saying to us, uh, and, and the author is saying to us, you need to, to just let that be, and to grow in your faith. Now, sometimes it takes time, right? I mean, if, if I plant a little pansy seed, I know that it'll take a while before I ever see a flower. Sometimes I know that if I water it too much, it's not going to grow at all. Sometimes I know if there's not enough water, it won't grow. But I know that that seed is always there and will work because that's what God put into it. This passage, though, actually the whole book of Hebrews is one of, the, one of the books of the Bible where there was some contention whether or not it should be included in the New Testament. Now, for those of you who don't know, what happened was they had a, they had a seminar, a convention. It was in, um, oh, I can't remember right now, the convention center of that time. And so they, they pulled everybody else together, and they said, we're going to decide on which books are going to go into what we're going to call the canon, a $50 word for the New Testament. So they all decided, and, and, and for the most part, there was a lot of consensus. Yep, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, no problem with that. All, all the lot, letters to Paul, there wasn't much hesitation about any of the letters to Paul. Um, James, there were some people who were worried about James, and, and Hebrews was one of the other ones, and the book of Revelation was also one as well. But for the most part, there wasn't a whole lot of debate. But when it came to Hebrews, part of the reason was the passage that we just read today. Because the passage that we just read today seems to imply that you might be able to lose your salvation. Now, there's been a lot of debate about whether or not you can, once you believe on Jesus Christ, whether you can, quote, disbelieve and somehow be drawn out of that. I don't know where you're going to come down at, but... Here's the question that I want you to... We're going to steep this passage um, in a wider context. And I want you to remember something that most of you already know by heart. John 3.16. Anyone know John 3.16? I won't call on you to make you recite it. So you can go ahead and put up your hand if you know it. All right. God so loved the world that he gave his... That whoever believes in him... But... Have everlasting life. Okay, now I'm going to invite Damon to come and do the rest of the sermon for me since he already took it. No, I won't. All right, eternal life. Now, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, eternal life starts then. Some folks believe that eternal life is when their body gives out. Well, that's part of it. But eternal life truly is when you understand, when you believe, whatever that is, that Jesus Christ saves you from your sin, that the death on, his, on the cross is enough to cover our sins, the things that we do against God, forgives our sins, 
we also get the added benefit of having eternal life. And eternal life doesn't wait until the earthly body is dead. Eternal life is always happening. Always. That's what eternal means. So if that is true, then it must be true that we can't lose our salvation. Here's what I think is going on with this author. My mother sometimes would say some very nasty things to me. I'll have to tell her that when, I, when she calls today. I'm just recalling these things. But one of the things she would say, do you want to go to the orphanage? <laughs> do you want a spanking? Yeah, I want a spanking. Here. No. You know why she was saying that. Some of you, some of you folks who use that, quote, rhetorical question, and sometimes I wasn't kidding. Um, you use it because you want to get that kid's attention, right? You want them to wake up. You want them to be aware. Now, are they actually going to follow through on that? I never once thought I was really going to the orphanage, even when she drove me. <laughs> she wouldn't let me off. My grandfather would never let it happen. No, she wanted to make sure she had my attention. And then she followed through with saying the things that she wanted me to do. Do you want a spanking? No. All right, then shape up. That's what the author is using in this letter. Basically, the letter is saying, friends, grow up in faith. Don't be so shaky all the time. It's time for you to show your faith to other people because they are looking at you. So when those who are unbelievers look at you and see that, yeah, your world has fallen apart, but somehow you still are standing on the rock that never gives way, and you have this faith Sometimes it seems unshakable. Other times it seems a little shaky, but you still say, I still believe that Christ will get me through all things. Those unbelievers look and say, that's something that I don't have. And whatever it is that that person has, it's something that I desire. And it opens the door for a conversation with someone who doesn't believe. Just as important, though, is that we as believers have the same problems. Because over and over and over again in Scripture, God is constantly reminding His people of His faithfulness to us. Now granted, there are plenty of reminders in Scriptures about our unfaithfulness to God. But even more so then, as you go through every single page, you're going, wouldn't God just give up at one point? Never. Although I'm not the biggest fan of the book of Romans, Romans 8 is where I like to park. Because Romans 8 is that passage where it basically says there is nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Now, Paul will go through all kinds of different things that was important in their particular culture, but I'm telling you there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. You got money problems? Won't separate you from God's love. Not so well at the household? God's love is always strong. Have a few doubts about whether or not this or that is true in the Bible? God says, I love you, and I am here to stay with you. He never, never once gives up on us. Grow in God's love. Know that you are forgiven. And know that we are called to be a people of faith. All God's people said. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing as, as you're able. Uh, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart.